say amen if you're at Matthew 6 and 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Anybody got any things going on? Anybody got any things you need? Any things you need answers to? They might be health things, financial things, family things, job thing. It's a lot of things. But the, the key to those things is to get the master of all things involved. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, we need you. We need your help. God, this house is, I hope this house is full of honest people. So I need you today, God. I, I pray for your help, your unction today to allow me to bring forth this thought to your, your beloved today. Let an impartation of your spirit go forth. Your, your word is alive. It's quick, Lord. I pray that it gets planted in the fertile soil of every, every, every person's soul today. Let it germinate and grow and manifest itself in a life lived for you. Bless it. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Before you're seated, give someone a high five, a handshake, a holy hug, and welcome to the house of God today. Amen. I'm going to go on our reading to Matthew 15. I'm going to start at verse 22. It's a familiar portion, but I want to, I want to bring some things out. I, I want us to I want us to self-apply, and I, I've used that phrase a lot. If, 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 you'll, if, you, if you quit holding the Bible at a distance and pull it in close, you're going to find it works. It works. And I, I'm hoping to, to lay something out there that'll work for you today if you let it. And behold, a woman of Cana came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. Now listen to this. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. I, I, let me just help you. That's the devil's world out there, and it don't love you. It likes owning you. It likes having you on the line. The devil's sitting there on his big old giant bass boat, reeling some people in and enjoying the struggle that you're going through. Now, hold on here. Get this. Remember, she's speaking to Jesus. She brought up the fact that she's got a daughter. She's got a situation at home. A devil has attacked her house. <laughs> devil will attack your marriage, attack your relationship, attack your health. He's going to attack anything and everything that you do not have covered by the blood of Jesus. But he answered her not a word. Anybody ever feel like Jesus ain't talking back to you? <laughs> Come on, brother Lord. Yeah, someone be with me today. And then Jesus not talking to you, and then his, then his church folk. And his disciples came and saw him saying, send her away. And I just got in the church. They don't even like me here. <laughs> and I'm talking about the pastor. <laughs> uh, send her away, for she crieth after us. Everybody say needy people. We're all needy. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is important. But you're going to have to pay attention because I'm not going to give the clue to this till the end of this message. How many were here last week? Boys, I didn't even realize this was going to tie in until I woke Sister Crow up to tell her this. <laughs> then she came and worshipped him he's, he's, he's kind of ignored her he's kind of told her not come for you but look what she did she came and worshipped him see, see you're, you're going to pursue what you know the answer is whether it wants you, likes you 
or not. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There'll be something in your life if you never choose to fully live for God that he's going to be able to bring up and say, if you'd have pursued me like you pursued that. If you would have fallen in love with me like you fell in love with that. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let me, let, me, let me get real for just a minute. I know I'm in the middle of my text, but we already started today. If you would have pursued after God like you did that person, that job, that money, that hobby, yeah, that persona. You want everybody to think you're all that. In the we are so image-driven today, it is absolutely ridiculous. It is sad. You don't have to have nothing, but if you look like you do, you succeeded. Are you here? See, we forgive me, young people, and I'm glad we send most of them out. I said this the other day, but the, the problem with America today and the world is we're so focused on young people ain't never done nothing. When the folks in this room, you got a little bit of life in you. You got some stuff. You got, we, la, la. I don't need a five-year-old to try to tell me what kind of. <laughs> You're a boy. You're a girl. I'm so glad my parents weren't in this time because you know what? I was raised with three sisters. He's playing with Barbies. I had three sisters. They even put a dress on me. My God, I would have been doomed if that was today. <laughs> but I'm so thankful that uh, biologically we know the truth. Amen. They can confuse it, but God made a man and made a woman. And when they get together, they make babies, and they're either boys or girls. The devil's a liar. All right? God is not the author of confusion. Man is. Are you with me? But she came and worshipped him. Now, you may be here today, and you may be estranged from God. You may be mad at God. You may question God. You could be angry at God right now. He could even have been ignoring you, but she did so. She worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But the answer to said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. You know what? She didn't deny it. She didn't criticize it. She didn't say, yeah, but uh, you have to give to me and some sort of political nonsense. No. Truth, Lord. Because she understood her history. She understood the family history. She understood the tribal history of her life that's going to make sense when I get to the end here. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She accepted the lot in life. She accepted the curse that was placed over her tribe and her hands. She accepted it. I understand, God, that we've been rejected because something one of my ancestors did. I get it, but I know your Lord. I know your God. I know your Jesus. I can't go out there. I can't go. You're the only answer I got. You're the only one I know that really can. And when she made that statement, listen, you can be disqualified. You can have done everything wrong to where the whole world will write you off, but you approach Jesus like this today. If you bring him that, and you, I, I know I don't deserve it. I, 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 know I, know, I know I knew better. I know that I really didn't take you serious, God. And Jesus answered and said, oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter, and her daughter, her home, her family, life was made whole from that hour because she sought Jesus first. Even when she wasn't qualified, even when she wasn't allowed, she still sought Jesus. So, listen, if, if, if this lady under these circumstances can do that, What's your hold up? John 4 and 24, 23 and 24 says this, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers, what did she do? She worshiped. 
thou worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Understand, we've had a lot of years where that, that church had the truth and that church had the spirit. And that church has got the light show and that church has got the concert. Now, let me tell you something. It's time to be where the truth and the spirit are being taught, preached. And there is a difference. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. I know what kind of people I'm looking for. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm going to give you three phrases. Some of you have been around here for a minute, might know this, but those of you who don't. God is omnipresent everywhere at all times. God is omniscient. He knows all, and God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. But understand, it is up to us to activate that in our lives. You got to activate God. You've got to allow God. You got to say, okay, God, I, I'm tired of doing it my way. I seek you now. I, I, I know I've been going that way and that way, and I know I'm a dog. I, 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 don't, I don't have a right to, but I know you're the only answer. Everything else has failed. Drugs has failed. Alcohol has failed. Illicit relationship, being a philanderer, millions of dollars have failed. Oh, it's all failed. I'm miserable. You can activate God in your life today. He chose. He's coming back for a church, the Bible says. He's coming back for church without a spot and wrinkle. He, he's coming back for a people that worship him in spirit and truth. He's qualified this. He made a statement. There's a statement made in Mark 6, verses 5 and 6. And he could do no mighty work. Save that he laid his hands upon a few sick people. He healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. He will not force himself into your life. You see, it's not God knows what I need. He should just do it. Some of you might be stuck right in that realm right there. Well, if he's God, why don't he just... I'm God, but you haven't opened the door to let me be God in your life. Yes. Revelation 3 and 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That trial you hear, yes, that's that trouble you're going through, if any man hear my voice, do you hear him today? Yes. And open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. Yes. The question today is like, want to speak to you on this subject. Intentional interruption. You ever heard someone say, I don't mean to interrupt, but do you realize you just did it? That's exactly what you meant to do. <laughs> Anybody want to open the door miraculous in your life? God does not have to be a stranger to you. You can make decisions and choices that alters the direction. That alters the amount of influence God can have in your life. You know, you, if God can mend your heart, but you've got to give him all the pieces. God can put your life together, but you've got to give him access to everything. There's a psalm in Psalm 84, verses 1 through 3. Now, you have to understand that this is a psalm for the sons of Korah. This is an amazing story, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but I'll give you a quick just snapshot. The sons of Korah, are the sons of, anybody remember the name Korah? He's the one who fought against Moses or resisted Moses. Who do you think you are? But then there was, Korah had authority. But Moses was God's man in authority. Korah didn't want to submit to that. And so he rebelled. But when he rebelled, thank God his son said, you know, Dad, I get it. But this, this is an eternal issue. I'm going to go stand with the man of God. And they didn't go to their tent. And so when everybody was struck down, the sons of Korah didn't suffer that fate. But they, they make a statement here, and I want you to get this. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. 
They want the things of God. They almost, they almost suffered a fate. They almost lost it all. If they, if they'd have followed a backslid reprobate dad, that they'd have been in a mess, but they didn't. And, the, and they say, my heart and my flesh. There's something about getting your, getting your body in tune with what you, what, what your spirits try. There's something about finding that place. When we have our, our, our week of prayer and our, our, our prayer and fast, there's something about saying, no flesh, you're gonna, you're gonna submit to this. You're, you're gonna start wanting this too. And it's, says, my flesh crieth out for the living God. I got enough dead stuff in my life. I want God in my life. And it goes on and it goes to, goes to yea, the sparrow hath found a house. And the swallow a nest for itself where she may lay here. Again. There's something about finding a place to dwell. And the sons of Korah said, in life, life in that too, even thine altars. Now, an altar, and I'll get into this a little bit more. This, do we call this an altar in the church? Okay. But you can make an altar right where you're at. You can be driving down the road in your car and create an altar right there and a commitment, and, and you can have that communion and consecration with God. You have to understand, altars are important. Places of commitment, consecration, and sacrifice are important to God. They are what open the door to the miraculous. There is great power found at an altar. Nothing is more important in the church than the altar. It's, it's not the chairs. It's not even the pulpit, the piano, or, or, or the drums, or the speakers, or all that. The most beautiful church buildings in the world are totally ineffective without a place to make an altar. The most important things happen at an altar. Change happens at an altar. Uh, transformations happen at an altar. It's the altar that, that, that slobbering drunks lay down their bottles. And at an altar, drug addicts, uh, 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 drug addicts are redeemed. And the wicked can be purified and Sinners are born again and uh, families are restored and parents learn to lead their children and the suicidal can find peace of mind. Uh, the sick can be healed and financial miracles can, can come forth. And it's where people and churches and lives are revived. It said that element of an altar. Thank God for the altar. To, to really keep it simple, and, and, and for those that, 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 that really aren't familiar, altars had two purposes. It was the place to give an offering to God. There were various offerings uh, lifted up to the Lord in the Old Testament, to uh, the burnt, the drink, the free will, the, the heave, the meal, the sin, and even the thanks offering. They were presented the altar of God. The purpose was to get approval or favor over their lives, or the work that they were doing. There was something about making sure that you took take a few steps in life that you involved God in what you're doing. The seek ye first, the kingdom of God thing. If we don't have God's favor over our lives, it's very easy to become lost and even in trouble. The altar is a place of sacrifice to God. It's at an altar of God where you, you bring that personal sacrifice or the atonement from sin. The people were required to give their best. See, we live in a world today. Let me, Come on. I'll just throw this in the offering. Or, uh clean the bathroom, let me go be somewhere else. Come on. This is the house of the Lord. How many of you like everybody pitching at your house? Yeah? Every, everybody, everybody has their job in their house. I guarantee you, Sister Peach's house, she got that thing set up. Because there's just too many of them for not everybody to pull a little weight. Hello? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Well, God watches us when it comes to his things. Where's the balance at? The Bible has this, uh, it talks about you're weighed in the balances and found wanting. Or you're deficient or, or you're out of balance. 
you're seeking other things first. Romans 12 reminds us, it says, we are to give ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. In other words, the, the greatest altar moment is when we say, I give myself to you, Lord. You know, there were some people in the Bible that we know, and we know them well, and we, we, we preach them and teach them and tell their stories, but the defining moment was at an altar. Noah had an altar. Oh, Abraham, you want to talk about an altar? He, 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 he had an altar after dividing the land with Lot. Isaac, while headed to Gerar because of the famine that was going on. Jacob, after meeting with Esau, discovering the power of forgiveness. Moses, after the Israelites were attacked by an enemy for the first time since leaving, the, oh, they built an altar. Joshua built an altar. Gideon built an altar. Samuel, Elijah, David, Manasseh. I wonder what Peter's altar looked like after denying Christ. I wonder what that one looked like. If the altar was important to them, shouldn't it be important to us today? That moment, that place of... Uh, let me help you. It, it's more than just coming to the church. It's like you're based on what kind of employee you are, not just because you showed up to work, but by what you... You can show up to school, but... Your, your grades and everything are, are, are adjusted according to how you, why do we have such a level of, and I hope excellence, hope every one of us wants to be the best at those areas when we want to walk in here and let me do as little as, that may hit home, but listen, I don't want that to hit home and hurt. I want to hit the home and let you know how good he is at deceiving us. You see, that that's, and you've heard me say this a lot lately, I'm going to keep saying it. The problem with being deceived is you don't know that you are. Who, who, who you used to be may be the actual problem of how come you haven't become. Can I say this? The altar is amazing. Yeah, I said amazing. Not only is it amazing, but sadly it's often overlooked and mostly left out of our lives today. Maybe that's why most of us are not where we should be spiritually. We like to say, well, I'm good with God. We, we, him and I got our own thing going. That's not even in the Bible. Preach it. Come on. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together yeah. as the manner of some is. That there's something about gathering. He says, where two or three are, there I am. When you gathered in his name, there's something that transpires. There's something that happens. Naaman is a good example of, of someone that, I'm just going to get God on my terms. And I granted, God could have, when he went to the, to, to the pastor, the Old Testament prophet then, and the guy just said, oh, God, healed in Jesus' name or whatever. But that's why God always allowed a man to be in the middle of it. We don't like that pastor thing. We don't always like that boss. But there's that order. We don't like the teacher. Well, trust me, I, I'm married to a teacher. Parents don't want, it's the teacher's fault. <laughs> well, no, you got me on this one. Yeah. Let me help y'all just so you can be great to your teacher. Your teach, the teachers aren't there to discipline your children. They're there to educate. If you'll discipline, you've got a smart kid. If they go there in mind, they won't. But understand, the man of God understood for Naaman to really be able to get the healing he needed, to get what he really needed, that moment with God, he needed to humble himself. True. You know, we're not going to do it the way you think. So God will put a man in your life, a pastor, and he'll, he'll say, you know what, I, I, I get he did it this way for that. And I said this the other day too, you need some firsts in your life. When's the last time you had a first? That brand new moment, brand new, you never had with God before. That, that, that moment where, oh man, I got a new, re re God wants me to do it. God, some of us, you, you haven't moved spiritually. You just, you just haven't moved. 
You're still singing the same song. You, you still got the same favorite verse. You're saying the same stories. Uh, you pray, pray to the same colloquial, listen to the same songs, talk about the same good old days. People in trouble have memories, but people doing something have dreams. And Naaman had to go and dip himself in the muddy old river for him to find the humility that would help sustain his healing. You see, an altar, it's not always a physical place as much as it is a position or posture of giving or bringing or submitting to God. Now, I know people question that if the altar is so great, why and what makes people so afraid of it or to come to it? What makes it so hard to come to an altar? After all, really, if you think about them, they're just a little wood, padding, fabric, and paint. What's so scary? They're not too far off from them chairs y'all sitting in. There are other items in the building tonight, today. Did anybody wonder if you wanted to sit in that chair? Some of you guys singing when you walked up on the platform? Oh, hold on. Anybody struggle with using a table in a Sunday school or sitting to eat in a... Uh. None of those seem to bother us, but why? Why does it bother us so bad to use an altar, come to an altar? What, what is it that's happened that even good old church folks... I don't go there. Well, if you go, you're admitting you need help. If you go, you'll have to be humbled. If you go, your true self will be revealed. Probably. But regardless of all that, we need an altar. If you're a born-again Christian, full of the Holy Ghost, don't ever get to the place where you feel like you don't need to come and pray anymore, where you don't need to come and find a place at an altar. If you're a sinner and if you're not living right, the best choice you can make is to come to an altar. In fact, it really doesn't matter who, what, when, why, or anything about you. There's something about everyone. I need an altar in my life. I need a, a definitive place where I, I mark and I know that I've had an experience with God and uh, I, I'm going to step away from anything that I might think that I am or might know that I am. I may be a sinner and know that, but I need an altar. Uh, I may have this in my life, but I need an altar. Don't worry about other folks. They need the altar, same as you. Can, can, can I say it this way? Whatever you got to do, don't argue with God. Shut up whatever it is that's keeping you in. Don't argue why you can't come. Blow hell's mind. Clean and clear your heart and just come to an altar. The altar is a place of sacrifice, Genesis 22. Abraham had already, by this point, given up almost everything under the Lord, his home, his land, his family, prestige and comfort. Yet God said, I want more than that. I want to be above all things in your life, Abraham. Well, thank God he had an altar. Abraham had to make a decision. Do I give God or do I not? Some of us can fail to make that decision. But we have that same decision to make. Not only does God want burdens. How many want to give him your burdens? But God has wants. Our family our friends, our job, our possessions, children, our wants, our needs. Everything needs to be on the altar. The altar is a place of worship. When God had just brought Noah through the darkest time in history up to that point, the storms had raged. Judgment had fallen upon all mankind, yet Noah had been brought through it all. So when Noah was on the other side and God had brought him through it all, 
Can you just imagine surviving a storm nobody else did? Simply because the difference between you and them was an altar? Can you imagine the storms as they, as they floated on that water, safely on the inside of, a, of, of an ark, knowing that friends that he had, family that he had, were now dead, and who did not believe him all the years he preached and had an altar? I wonder if he'd heard some of them breathe their last breath or scream their last scream, and they, they died in the judgment of God, and really the only thing that separated them was an altar. God brought Noah through the storm. However, nothing would ever be the same. And what would he do? Do you know when he got out of the ark what he did? He built another altar. Listen, don't, 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 don't get all this confused with human emotions. <laughs> what do I mean by that? And I'm going to say something's going to shock you. And if you've been here the last couple of services, this will key right in. Those who have maintained an altar are not going to waste any time in heaven weeping over those who didn't. That's true. Oh, that grates against the spirit of this age. Don't it? Did you feel that? Altars will alter eternity. An altar will, listen, not only when there are storms in life, but altars are important after the storms. We should be constantly at an altar, at a place in our life. Well, you know what? Uh, I'm not playing church. I got this. I'm going to make sure I'm in a relationship with God. We, we should be constantly at an altar praising God for all that he's done. I, I, I'm either heading into the storm or I've come through a storm or I'm in a storm. Either way, I need an altar. I need an altar for everything he's done. I need an altar for an altar for everything he's going to do. I need an altar for what he's doing right now. And if you've got some mistakes, if you've got some missteps, or or even a big fat mess on your hands, there's nothing better to have than an altar. An altar is a way to get that all cleared up. If if you read in Second Samuel, David made a huge. How many of you have ever heard of David? Considered the greatest king. He made a mistake. He goofed. His error cost someone their life. That's a mistake, folks. When he did that, he, he got upset. He got upset at God. So that emotion isn't new to you. Get over your bad self. But you see, when he finally got himself back right with God, do you realize what he did? He built an altar every six paces. What's he saying? I'm never going to forsake the altar again. In fact, I'm going to make it so important to, that every six paces, I'm going to stop and worship and praise and let God know I ain't never going to get sideways again. I'm never going to get to that place uh, where I don't think I need an altar. I don't care if I got to run to the altar, build the altar. I'm going to make sure I have an altar. And it says in 2 Samuel, it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed. Every six paces. The altar is a place of dedication. Aaron had to continually burn incense every morning and evening upon the altar. That takes dedication. That takes effort. That takes purpose. That takes focus. We have to be dedicated to living for God. You just can't casually live for God like you, like you can't be casually in a marriage. You're not a good parent if you're casually a parent. You're going to be chasing them little critters around. You hear what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We have to be dedicated to the altar of God. Always sending up prayers, praise, and worship. Psalms 141, David makes this statement, Lord, I cry unto thee. Make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. I need an altar, personally. Listen, I, I, I've been around this thing. Ready to say how old I am. I've watched churches quit using the altar. I've watched 
friends remove altars out of their churches. I've watched them go, well, we don't need the altars anymore. We'll, we'll add lights and we'll add this and we'll do that, but we're not going to have the altars anymore because it makes that sticky moment for people because they have to address the real issue at hand. But isn't that what church is for? If a hospital is for dealing with sickness, I'm telling you the church is still here to deal with sin. I mean, all have sinned and come short of God. I'm here to tell you that this church is still here to do. We're not a club. We're not a social issue here. We make social lives, but we're still here with an altar ready to deal with whatever mess, whatever sin, whatever sickness, whatever disease, whatever is going on. We're not going to stop preaching the altar. We're not going to stop believing God for an altar. I to break it to you. I haven't lived perfect my whole life. Like you. There's been a few times I got distance between me and the altar. I got a little distant from God. I had gotten busy or ignored my need of being that living sacrifice like Romans 12 calls us to be. And some of us, well, I don't need that. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I'll just turn around in my seat or I'll just, I don't really need to be demonstrative in my need for an altar. I refer you back to David's every six paces. Talking to a friend recently, once a dynamic pastor of an absolutely amazing church. The envy of the city, really. And he lost it all. I remember running into him and I asked him, I said, what happened? You know what his words to me? Steve, I just simply stopped praying. The, the, the pain, the agony, the loss, and the magnitude is so great. He doesn't even live in the United States anymore. Listen, let me say this to you. I'm not, I'm not coming here to talk to make anybody feel condemned. In fact, today the altar is a place of hope. It's a place of hope and help. Yes, it's still a place of sacrifice. But it's really about what you receive in return. You see, 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 see I, I, I'll, I'll give him my pain and I'll take his promises. <laughs> I'll tell you, if you're in need of finding help from God, you're going you're gonna to find it at a dedication, at an altar. You know, if we'd be a little bit more like that old liar Jacob and get a hold of God and not let him go till he blesses us and, 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 and have an altar that we build in our lives. I, he was a liar at an altar. It's a sad day when a liar comes to an altar. The altar made the difference. If the old priest had to burn incense continually throughout all generations, where, where should we be in that? We should be showing our dedication and consecration to the Lord day in and day out, year in and year out, dedicated to the Lord, living a life at an altar. How long has it been since you had a true altar experience? You know, the priests had to be right with God to walk in there. In order to get the blessings in the presence of God and the protection of, well, he, he, he had to make sure everything was, he, he had to make sure he was right before that altar. The altar today is a place of forgiveness. The Bible tells us in Romans, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be, be a, here's a great word, propitiation. Yeah, come on, preach it, Pastor. Through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. I need remission of sins. 
plenty of remission of sin. He's the atonement. That's what propitiation means. He's, he's the victim now. He took my place. He shed his blood. Now my, the altar to me is a place I come because it's already his blood there. I need to come and make sure my repentance is there, that I place my sin there, that I place my burdens there. He's taking my place. I've got to make sure that I put my sin there so it can be covered by the blood. That John 3.16 is in a salvation. It's, it denotes the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his blood. Acts 2.38 tells us that we are to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. I got to thinking about this, and I got a, a statement that I want to say to you. Never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. Napoleon said that. I got to thinking about that adulterous woman. And I'm going to bring bringing this close here shortly. Now, I doubt she was thinking this way. But because I get to read it from the comfort of my home, this is a horrible situation. I'm pretty sure the men that grabbed her, Sister Asia, I'm pretty sure they were like, yeah, we got you. And they thought they were taking her to her doom. They, they couldn't have been a greater enemy right then to her. <laughs> they took her to Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Can you imagine? They took her to the right place. <laughs> the enemy made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Don't, don't, don't become your own worst enemy and keep yourself from an altar. Oh, thank God for the enemy. There's a necessity of having an adversary. Some of you need to realize that argument that's keeping you from it's very much giving you an awareness that you got an enemy. You better get there and drag him with you. Oh, can you imagine? how they thought when they were putting Daniel in the lines. Yeah, we got you now, pal. Imagine as I grabbed those three Hebrew boys by the scruff of the neck and got ready to throw them in the fiery furnace. Can you imagine this thing Goliath had as he looked down at David? Oh, man, this is going to be easy work. But you have to understand, that's the importance of an altar. Victories at your altar. That's where the fire falls. That's where Abraham got his son back and God got his answer. That's where Noah built an altar and Jacob built an altar and Joshua built an altar. Job sacrificed at an altar and he got twice that. Oh my God, thank, that's some pretty good company to be in. If they had an altar, let's God give, give me my altar. I'm going to have an altar. And I, you, if you don't want it, I'll take it. If you don't want an altar in your life, you fight. Go on now. Give me my altar. I want an altar in my life. Go ahead with your prideful self. Keep the pride. I hope I don't get any of that. I want an altar in my life. I'm not too old. I'm not too young. I'm not too rickety. Give me an altar. Give me an altar for my enemies. Give me an altar for my pride. Give me an altar for my frailties, my sicknesses. Give me an altar. I want a real prayer life. See, because that real prayer life opens the door to miraculous. How many knows who anointed David to be king? So, thank you, Samuel, right? No. That joker wouldn't have been around without Hannah. But Hannah was barren. In fact, the Bible says she had an adversary that provoked her. Well, you don't think God wanted Samuel to be born to come and do what he was going to do? So he took this little lady and says, I've got to get you fired up, mad, and upset. I've got you to realize you need to get a prayer life, Hannah. See, she had a husband that provided everything for her. It says so. She had no need. She didn't. She had everything taken care of. She didn't even need God. 
Elkan, Elkanah didn't even pick up on it. Aren't I better, you arrogant fool? You know, it cost your wife her own soul because you're arrogant and prideful. Man, Pastor Tom laying it out like that, yeah? But the Bible says in 1 Samuel, and her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. Now, you can look at it that way, or you can look like the enemy's making a mistake. Anybody here want to make it to where the enemy's making a mistake in your life? Can I say it this way? Stop making peace with your problem. Stop making peace with that issue. Stop being okay with not being right with God. Stop being okay with not having an altar. Stop making treaties and compromises with your prideful, arrogant self. It ain't helping you. Those are enemies, bad habits, proclivities, addictions. You're okay with that all while having being at odds with Almighty God? That enemy, man, he's good. We got a good devil. <laughs> Keep it in context, folks. Too many folks have made treaties with your trouble. You're in the same place you've been for 20 years. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But you see, I wonder if someone get a spirit of hand in here. I had enough of that. I'm tired of being barren and broken. I'm tired of watching someone run around with my blessings. I, I'm tired of seeing someone. Wait a minute. What, God's only got enough favor for them and not for me? God can only use them and not me? I'm telling you, you might be just an adversarial situation away from your anointing. But if you ain't going to get upset with your problem, you can keep your problem. If you ain't going to get upset with your sick self, you can stay sick. The Bible says in 1 Samuel, she had had enough. It says in 1 Samuel 1, and she was in bitterness of soul. And that's where some of you stay. I've been there. I mean, I, I like getting mad, son. We, we don't want someone to tell us to be right when we're being wrong. How would I say that? Don't ever tell someone to calm down when they need to calm down. They're not going to calm down. They're going to raise the level. Why? We got that nature in us. The only person that can talk to that person at that time is that person. Come on, I got someone in here who can tell the truth. Say, amen, Pat, that's the truth. Your wife ain't going to get you to calm down. Your husband, oh, Lord, your husband, you ain't going to get her to calm down for nothing. Go, go find a seat before she hurts you. You're making your own sandwiches for lunch. Stop it. Get out of the way. The Bible even tells you, get up on the roof of your house and get out of her way. We got natures and things to deal with. Don't come in up here acting all cute and pretty because you can put a little suit on and a tie on today, sing a few little songs. Oh, we at church. You ain't at church till you've been at an altar. You ain't at church till you've dealt with your nasty self, till you've dealt with your sinner self, your arrogant self. Your opinions and your ideas. I've got to get my carcass to an all. I'm tired of my enemy provoking me and beating me. Who was it said we found our enemy and the enemy's me? So Hannah prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Thank God for an altar. Thank God for an altar. Hannah's prayer, Hannah's, Hannah's, Hannah's situation gave us the prophets. Nineveh was doomed. But they got an altar. Israel was losing. They were defeated. But good old man of God built an altar on top of Mount Carmel and restored Israel's victory. How about the altar I mentioned earlier? Peter's altar. I don't even know idea what he did, but thank God he did. I'm thankful for Acts 2.38. Well, I don't need a prayer life like that. I, I dare you this week. Me measure your internet time with your prayer time. This week. 
Measure your entertainment time with your God time this week. You know you can make yourself famous in heaven right now? Y'all don't believe me? Cornelius did. Acts chapter 10, he was famous in heaven for building a prayer room. His prayer was so consistent and so faithful, it built a mind. I didn't even know it could do that. He didn't even know it could do that. His personal altar was his priority. His altar drew the attention of You need heaven's attention right now? Listen, you just don't do that in a day. You can't do that with an ebb and flow of life prayer. You can't do that with the only when I'm in trouble prayer life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Cornelius, Cornelius' altar impressed God so much, it caused God to send some special men straight to his door. Behold, I stand at the door. I wonder how many people here right now, God's been having someone knock on your door. I wonder if I'm the man standing and knocking at the door that God sent today. He chose men to go to his house to save his entire household. Is there anybody here that would like the supernatural orchestrated miracles like that? Anybody want that in your life? I get it. I know. God, yeah, I come to church. Leave me alone. Let me just sit here. I don't want to mess my hair up. I don't want to sweat it. I just came to church because I just come to church. I, I don't really get involved. I, I don't really come here to build an altar. I, I really don't need anything. But is there anybody here that wants to walk with God like that? Anybody want the downpour of the Holy Ghost? Anybody want the power of Pentecost in your life? Can I say that if a Cornelius can't get a miracle because he prayed, and Nineveh can be saved because he prayed, and Peter can be redeemed because he prayed, and Adam's barren womb can be opened because he prayed, I wonder if all these people, the, the Abrahams and all these men, but wait a minute. We got a woman here whose daughter, whose household is vexed with the devil. An evil spirit of sickness. If she can get a miracle. If she who's, 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 who's not allowed cursed and get a miracle. Is there anybody here that needs a miracle today? I wonder if there's somebody here in this house today needs a miracle. Let me show you what putting God first and pursuing Jesus can do to reverse a curse. Matthew 15 and 22, it said, Behold a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. He's talking about lineage. She understands some things. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. You need to send nobody away. If you want God, we're here to help. If that makes you uncomfortable, that's okay. We don't want you to just come to church. We want you to be the church. We just don't want you to know about Jesus. We want you to know him. I believe he's got blessings, miracles, signs, and wonders for you if you want him. And they came and saw him saying, send away for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Bible says, then she came and worshiped him. He sent her away, and she continued to come. Yes. How many people are going to stand in judgment because every church service you get an invitation to come, but you'd rather walk away? Oh, come on. Come on. Truth, Lord. Yes. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Yes. Wow. Then Jesus answered and said, oh, woman. Don't you put your name right there. Oh, oh, Carl. Oh, Verdell. Oh, Isaiah. Oh, Doris. Put your name there. I wonder if today 
that you can go ahead and shock the socks off of God. And he could turn to you and say, oh my, I know what you're going through. I know what you're facing. But you came anyway. And you kept coming. And you kept coming. And you pursued me. Even though you got problems in your home. You next to everything going wrong. You weren't allowed to. But you came anyway. Can I tell you when he said, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou will. And her daughter was made whole right then. Vexed literally means amiss, diseased, evil, grievously, miserably sick. A devil, a devil, a devil was afflicting her baby. You know what this lady didn't do? She didn't make peace with it. She didn't sit there and do nothing. She didn't just sit back and accept a doctor's diagnosis. You know what she did? She sought an altar with Jesus. A devil was attacking her home. She sought the Lord. She was living under a curse. She sought the Lord. Her house was a mess. She sought God. She had enough. And she was finally ready to deal with her devil. And she finally made her way to Jesus. The enemy had gone too far. She recognized. And you recognize the enemy in your home. She realized there was an enemy in her life. Are you hearing me? The last week we talked about Noah's mistake. Well. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. This is Genesis 9, 24 and 25. And he said, curse it, be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. That's what she's talking about. And Jesus, you've been cursed since Noah. Ain't none of y'all getting nothing from God. You ain't getting for what you did. You were cursed. You're not getting nothing. You know what she did? I'm fixing to turn that around. I'm going to turn that around. She kept coming. She kept coming. I wonder what, what's keeping you from, what's keeping, maybe you're the key to reverse the curse. Maybe if you finally decide, I'm tired of my family being on the outside. I'm tired of the sickness. I'm tired. If Zacchaeus can climb a tree and get his miracle. If a woman whose daughter is next to the devil can get her miracle. I wonder who today is going to pursue and get their miracle. God's still in the need meeting business. If you can send the rain and send men and send angels and send quail and send manna and send great fish, I, I wonder what you want him and need him to send you today. Of course, I have to be honest and I have to talk about both sides here. Of course, if you're on the wrong side of an altar, if you just refuse to Seek the Lord. The Bible talks about being sent to strong delusion. He sends things, you know. He sent 10 plagues on the, the Egyptians. He sent the death angel. You got to hear what I'm saying now. Either way, it all depends on how we live and what we live for. How will you regard the king of kings and lord of lord? Oh, it's just, just a church building and you just have grandfathered yourself out of having to really need it and you're just here to grace us and you're more important here than God? How do we revere the word or do we reject it? Do we obey it or disregard it? Do you have an altar? Have you created an environment? We could do many, you couldn't do any works with you. Have you estranged yourself from him and embraced the cares of life and drawn up a treaty with your bitterness? Can I tell you this? What could happen in your life? If you would build an altar. What could happen? What, what healing? What deliverance? What favor? What 
I, I don't want to put any limits on it because like I said, maybe you can get some firsts. Maybe you can be the first one God does something. Maybe you, you can be the first one God. Maybe, 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 I don't want to put limitations on it. I wonder what would happen if you would seek ye first the kingdom of God, if you will respond to his call. What could happen if you'd seek the Lord? Let's all stand. Years ago, I was living in Europe. And an amazing airplane that is all but forgotten today. Um, I got to I got to go see it without all the trim or the beautification. Anybody been in an airplane? If they removed all that plastic stuff, you're going to see so much wirings and sensors and so many electrical things in there to blow your mind. But years ago, and if you got any age on you, how many remember the Concorde? Man, that was a businessman's dream. Boy, that could that could just you could get to anywhere you want to, and it was just an amazing flying machine. The greatest machine of its day. That airplane flew for the Johnson for 31 years without an incident made life easy for those that had destinations they needed to get to in short time. It traveled at twice the speed of sound. But everything changed one July afternoon. I was taxiing down the runway in Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. Something is insignificant as a small piece of metal was laying on the runway. As it took off, that small piece of metal was hurled against the fuel tank, caused sparks, ignited the fuel, and in less than two minutes, that Concord crashed, killed everyone on board. One of the largest passenger sets crashed. One of the greatest machines because what is reported is a small piece of metal no larger than a penny. What's keeping you from soaring? What's keeping you from who you really could be today? Satan is always looking to get away with just putting a piece of something in there to derail you. Maybe it's a little bit of bitterness or unforgiveness. Maybe just a little, just a little bit of pride, but it's enough to bring it crashing down. Yes. And that little place becomes a foothold, becomes a stumbling block, and then a stronghold. Yes. There's a poem that was written about a famous battle. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, a horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of the rider, the battle was lost. For want of the battle, the kingdom was lost. All for the want of a little piece of metal. God has set before you an open door. I wonder if there's anybody here. I wonder, without fanfare, without fanfare, it's between you and God. No, don't, don't, even, don't worry about the person next to you. The, the, heaven is in, eternity is in your hands and your choices right now. I wonder, I, 
I'm going to open this altar for someone to come around. I don't know who you are today. Maybe you just had enough with sickness, or maybe you've had enough with that same problem, or maybe it's time for you as the head of your house to get your family. Maybe, maybe you're ready to get that little, that little thing out.